the island of courage. Raja, Sydney, and Liam flew out of the portal into a mass of fog. Squinting as the wind rushed past him, Raja tried to spot a glimpse of the land. The mist, mist dissipated and the three of them gasped at the sight of the next island. The afternoon sun displayed thick acacia trees that sat atop massive towering cliffs. Waves continually crashing against them, jagged boulders sticking out of the water formed the shore. Raja could see birds flying towards the top of the cliffs into the trees. A jolt of panic hit him. Where are we going to land this? Liam shouted loud enough to be heard over the wind and waves. The shore is all boulders and we are too low to fly above the cliffs. They started frantically looking around for a place to land, scanning the shoreline. Over there, Raja shouted. Sand spilled over one corner of the cliffs, making a waterfall down to the ground and spreading into a narrow inlet. They leaned the hang glider in that direction. In no time, they were soaring onto the ground. Digging in their heels to stop from crashing into the rocks, they tipped. Dropping the glider, <clears throat> they rolled forcefully into the side of the cliff, knocking down more sand, which buried them in shallow graves. As the sun sank below the horizon, Raja rolled painfully out of the sand. Sydney, Sydney, Raja called desperately. A delicate hand rose up, fingers spread, reaching for help. Raja grabbed hold and pulled Sydney out, patting her back as she coughed, struggling for air. Liam crawled over to them. I'm fine, thanks for asking, Liam sputtered sarcastically. Raja looked despairingly from Sydney and Liam, covered in sand, to the monstrous waves attacking the shoreline, the sheer cliffs at their back. Do you think we can climb up there, asked Raja with little hope. I don't think so. Those are at least a hundred feet high and I don't see any handholds, Liam observed. Sydney took off her bag and began searching through it. What are you doing, asked Raja. Seeing how much food we have left, Sydney sighed, and it's not much. Liam pulled an apple out of his pack and bit into it. This is all I have left, he smirked with his mouth still full. Sydney closed her eyes, willing the silent tears back. Raja felt concern for his friend and tried to comfort her. I'm afraid, Sydney admitted. Of what, Raja urged, urged, of dying here and never seeing Kaura with my own, with my own eyes, Sydney wept. Come on, there are plenty of things worse than dying here, Liam said. We could starve, be attacked by wild animals, or Los Losapa could catch up with us and, Raja kicked Liam in the shin, stopping his sentence short. Ouch, I was just trying to help, Liam shrugged innocently. Sydney laughed with irony. We are all afraid, Sydney, Raja admitted. <clears throat> a roar that seemed to carry on forever and grow in intensity broke the silence. Especially of that, Liam invol involuntarily trembled. The roar sounded again much closer, fumbling into each other's arms. The trio moved closer to the cliff, sitting against it for a sense of protection and strength. By some miracle, Liam and Sydney had managed to doze off a couple hours before sunrise. Raja tried to at least feel tired when he noticed a large silhouette glinting in the sun. It walked on four legs and had big bushy fur around its neck. Raja's heart skipped a beat as he recognized the animal. Fly in, Raja screamed in warning. Sydney and Liam jerked awake and struggled to pull out their knives. They stared at the predator's sharp claws at the end of its powerful legs. The lion whipped its tail back and forth as it prowled forwards, its sharp eyes locked upon them. Raja's heart raced when he could feel the beast's breath upon his face. Liam and Sydney clutched Raja's arms, their hands trembling. The lion opened its mouth and Raja flashed his knife with a battle cry. Save your courage, Raja. You will need it very soon. I am Kor, and I mean you no harm. Kor bowed his head slightly in greeting. Kor, what do you mean? Raja waited, waited for the pounding of his chest to subside. Without courage, you will make it no farther. You must act. Act? What do you want us to do? The only way out of here is to climb up a cliff with no handholds, 
or drown trying to swim around them in hopes of finding another beach. Assuming we aren't smashed against the rocks first, Liam was incredulous. You already know what you must do. I am here to teach you what you do not know. Which is? Sydney asked genuinely. Cor looked up into Raja's eyes. You must have courage, even if you cannot see where the road will lead. Turning to Sydney, Cor continued, courage is not being fearless. It is feeling fear, yet choosing to act. You must persist when things look hard and know that there is a bright future worth fighting for. Cor spoke last to Liam. I have asked something impossible of you, but on this journey, you have been asked to do and will be assigned many more impossible tasks. But can you tell me one thing that you have not been able to accomplish with Respa's help? They let Cor's words wash over them and enter their very souls. No, because when it comes to him, nothing is impossible, Raja pronounced. <clears throat> the ground beneath them rumbled. Looking out to sea, the climbers witnessed the sand at the end of the inlet breaking away and disappearing beneath the waves. The shore is breaking away, Sydney cried. We need to climb, Raja decided. And just how are we supposed to do that? Liam questioned. Another large chunk of shoreline crumbled and sank into the sea. The raging water crept even closer. If we keep arguing, the only choice, will, the only choice left will be to swim, Liam panicked. Kor, please show us the way, Raja pleaded. The mighty lion walked calmly in front of the sand waterfall flowing from the top of the cliff and roared commandingly. The sand parted, reveal, revealing rock handles jutting out off the face of it. Raja, Sydney, and Liam watched with awe as Kor pounced gracefully from one handle to the next until he reached the top of the cliff with ease. The earth shook as more of the inlet fell away. Quickly, Raja urged as he tied a rope from himself to Liam to Sydney. Grasping the first two handholds, Raja started his ascent. Beneath his fingers, the rocks began sliding back into the cliff face. The handles disappeared and Raja fell back hard onto the ground. Kor called to them from above, you must move swiftly, control your fear. Raja gritted his teeth and began climbing again. At 30 feet, Liam and Sydney lost their grips and hung from the rope. Raja groaned and breathed hard, his arms aching with the effort of holding both their weight until they found their footing. Remind me not to look down next time, Liam, Liam choked out. Halfway up, the sand fell thicker, covering their heads and irritating their eyes, making it harder to see the handholds. At 70 feet, Raja's arms were trembling and the handholds were growing sparse. Eventually, there were none left and Raja was trapped five feet below the top of the cliff. The last of the inlet disintegrated, leaving nothing but raging sea beneath him. He felt his last handhold slipping back as gravity began pulling him down. Raja, jump, Kor growled down at him. Looking down, Raja saw the 100-foot plummet below him. He desperately tried to hold on as his fingers had less to grip. I can't, Raja shook his head in terror. Kor's mane glowed as it blew in the wind and shone down on Raja's face. Courage! Conquer your fears. Save your friends, Raja. Raja looked down at the trust in Liam and Sydney's eyes. With his last inch of grip, he jumped, reaching above the cliff for what he could not see. His fingers brushed a tree root and Raja gripped it tight. His muscles straining, Raja struggled to pull himself up over the top of the ledge. The rope grew taut as Liam and Sydney's handholds disappeared and they hung below. Kor bit the line and helped Raja pull Liam and Sydney to safety. We made it, Liam panted. Kor waited patiently for the three to catch their breaths and stand in front of him. You have shown great courage this day. Continue to face the coming dangers with valor and hope. You will finish your journey honorably. Raja nodded his head in understanding. Kor turned and bounded away through the trees into the tall grass of the homeland leaving a cloud of dust in his wake. They watched Kor's magnificent form fade away into the sun on the horizon. Now what, Liam wondered. Raja pulled out the compass and waited for the spinning dials to settle. That way, Raja pointed and led the party through the trees. The further downhill they walked, the greener the grass, 
became the acacia trees giving way to oaks until out of the brush rose a tall gated wall dripping with ivy. The door was cracked open, inviting them inside. I don't like this, Sydney hesitated. We need food and shelter. Perhaps we can find both here, Raja decided. Each taking one side of the massive wooden gate, Raja and Liam pushed it slowly open. The doors groaned and creaked from being long unused, and within the walls was a city, ravaged and destroyed. The buildings were crumbling, charred by fire. They could still see some of the people who had been at war with each other, laying on the ground, dead, still holding their weapons. What could have happened here? Liam choked back a scream. They passed through the streets slowly, stepping over what remained of the carnage. Thunder cracked overhead and rain gushed down on top of their heads. Raja searched for a place to get out of the storm and saw a grand palace atop a hill. This way, Raja told Liam and Sydney, helping to guide them. The palace doors were swung open wide and unhinged. Bright fabric, golden treasures, and precious records were strewn about the hall picked through by looters. The kitchens should be off one of those corridors. We may find some wheat or rice, Raja hoped. Dried meat or honey, Liam thought excitedly. You take the right, I'll take the left. Raja asked Sydney if she would be their lookout and let them know if there was danger. Sydney wasn't too excited to be alone, but she watched as Raja and Liam left the room. They lit torches and searched down the halls, littered with torn tapestries and broken ornaments. Oops, hang on. Sydney stood with her hands clutched together, watching anxiously for them to return. The doors to the ballot palace swung shut and locked of their own accord. Sydney heard them creak and thud and turned to look. Her high-pitched scream traveled down the corridor, sending Liam and Raja running back to Sydney's side. They stopped short when they saw a large wolf poised to pounce. Liam pulled his knife. The wolf bared his sharp teeth and snarled. Raja set his hand on Liam's and helped him to lower the blade, which stopped the growling. Can you speak? Raja asked. What an insulting question. All animals can speak in their own language. You should be grateful I have taken the time to learn yours, the wolf bristled. Forgive me, what may we call you? I am Wotar. Wotar, do you know what happened here? Sydney asked apprehensively. This was once a great kingdom. The people were happy and prosperous. One day some men, no, not men, shadows of men, surrounded the city and filled the people's minds with dark and terrible thoughts. At first the citizens resisted. Then they started to succumb and believe the shadows twisted truths. The people's love turned into jealousy, depression, and anger. They spoke against each other behind closed doors, plotted and schemed for their own gain and pulled each other down until their dark thoughts turned to acts of violence and death fed by hate. Sorrow filled Wotar's voice as he spoke. We should leave here now, Liam was emphatic. He eyed Raja, it sounds like the foy. The doors are locked, Sydney whispered in fear. The only way out of the city is through the palace gardens. Follow me, Wotar commanded. Wotar led the trio through a series of corridors. On the way, Liam's stomach growled. I'm still hungry, Liam whined. Your empty bellies will sharpen your minds for the challenge ahead, Wotar explained. Sydney looked, or, Wotar led them and out of a set of double doors into a magnificent garden maze with bushes overgrown and roots encroaching on the path. In front of them were four distinct archways. We must each take our own path, but I will howl as often as I can to guide you through. Follow my voice and remember, you must control your thoughts. Use the power of the words you are given from the wisdom within to protect you from the shadows, Wotar warned. Raja took both Sydney and Liam's hands in his own. See you on the other side, 
he let them go and took the second path. Liam spread his arm wide toward the third path. Ladies first. Sydney choked back her terror and tiptoed into the maze. Liam took a deep breath and jogged into the fourth path. He turned right, ran until he hit a wall and then ran back. Trying left this time, Liam ran even faster, anxious to get out. A mist rose from the bushes and blurred Liam's vision. He slowed to a walk, reaching out his hands to try and feel his way. As each of them tried to find their way through the maze and the mist, they encountered visions of the other two telling them they'd never make it. They had to face their own fears and beliefs as they heard negative and mean things being said to them and about them. It was hard not to believe the words because the images looked so much like Raja and Sydney and Liam. Raja even saw an image of Losapa. Losapa told him he'd never make it to Kaura and he should quit right now and come with him back to Yalwuna. Losapa became angry and mean when Raja stayed strong. When Losapa told him he could have saved his father if he'd been with him, Raja believed him and felt a deep, dark despair enter his heart. Losapa said, you were always a great disappointment to your father. You failed him and now you're failing your friends. What do you have to say for yourself now? Losapa, Raja cried out. All right, I, oops, that was not right. What do you have to say for yourself now? The spark returned to Raja's eyes. I may have failed, but Inrop and Respa will not. They are more powerful than you. And if you get rid of me, they will send another even stronger than I. You cannot win, Losapa. Yalwuna's people will never be yours. They belong to Inrock, and Respa will save them. The Losapa's figure disappeared with a howl. And there, Raja sensed Wotar. He saw Wotar sitting on his hindquarters, waiting patiently as Liam, Sydney, and Raja walked subduedly out of the maze. Raja looked at Sydney with relief, but she avoided his gaze. Liam glared at Raja in a way he did not understand. Each of them was remembering the mean things the others had said to them in the maze. They weren't ready to forgive yet, even though they knew it was just images and not the real person. So you have faced the foy and conquered them. Now you understand the power of your thoughts and words that they have over your actions and of those who surround you. Never forget the battles you have fought today and what they have taught you. Wotar bade them goodbye and bounded away into the mist. Raja turned to Sydney. Are you all right? Sydney nodded, but still refused to look at him, remembering some of the things that he had said to her in the maze. Where to now, great leader? Liam was half sarcastic. Raja ignored Liam's tone and pulled out his compass into the trees. Sydney and Liam both waited for Raja to start walking before following him with a weary walk. The trees grew thicker and the air more humid as the sun set, Raja kept looking back at his friends, hoping they would speak to him. But Sydney and Liam kept silent with their gaze locked in the distance. Backing up, Raja fell into step with Sydney. Do you want to talk about it? He asked gently. About what? Sydney replied nervously. What you saw in the maze. Raja waited patiently for Sydney to share her experience. It wasn't important. Sydney shook the memory away. How can that be? Raja was incredulous. Leave her alone, Liam demanded. What I saw was terrible. It affected me greatly and it might help all of us to talk about it, Raja pleaded. Well, she doesn't want to. You're not always the one with the right answer, Raja, Liam pointed out irritably. It's all right, Liam, Raja is just trying to help. Sydney fought to smooth things over. That's right, take his side as usual, Liam said, with hurt in his voice. Raja put his hand on Liam's shoulder. Don't speak to her like that. Liam smacked Raja's hand away. So now you don't like the way I talk. I can't do anything right, can I? 
Not even this, Liam punched Raza, Raja in the nose. Sidney cried out in surprise and Raja wiped the blood from his face and plowed into Liam. And they both went down. Stop it, Sidney yelled as Liam and Raja fought and wrestled their way into a muddy pond. Liam pinned Raja under the wa muddy water. Who's stronger now? Sidney jumped into the muddy water and climbed on Liam's back. Get off of him. Liam and Sidney fell back into the muddy water and all three of their heads turned as something long and sticky smacked them across the cheek. They stared uncomprehendingly as the tongue wound back into a little chameleon's mouth. It sat in a tree looking down on their dirty faces. You are late for dinner and being late is not polite, the chameleon explained as he climbed down from the tree. Follow me, please. The chameleon rocked back and forth as he slowly tiptoed away, giving the trio plenty of time to climb out of the murky pond. He led them through the trees into a meadow of brightly colored tropical flowers. The darkness of the night was lit by hundreds of fireflies. On a stone table sat the most massive banquet they had ever seen. Avocados, coconuts, figs, oranges, grapefruit, bananas, pineapples, mangoes, tomatoes, corn, potatoes, rice, squash, yams, and every kind of nut roasting on a warm fire, making their mouths water with hunger. Before you eat at Toboto's table, please wash and delouse yourself, Toboto said with laughter in his eyes. Raja, Liam, and Sydney all looked down to see themselves covered not only in caked mud, but giant black leeches. Sydney screamed and jumped up and down, shaking her arms. Raja and Liam both calmed her with soothing whispers and patiently pulled the parasites off of her. Thank you, Sydney felt a hundred times better. Do me, do me, Liam begged. Sydney and Raja began plucking the creatures free from Liam's, Liam's skin. He bit his tongue when it hurt and hurried to wash after he was done so he could eat. Sydney and Raja looked at each other with embarrassment. Raja was the first to break the awkward silence. I trust you. Sydney shyly reached her hand up to Raja's face and began gently working the critters off. He contorted his face to help her, making funny faces and could not help but smile in amusement. This made Sydney laugh for the first time in days. With the leeches all disposed of and the mud all washed away, the trio sat down to eat in awkward silence. Leeches have wicked tongues with the power to suck the life out of another creature, not unlike our own tongues. Toboto jumped onto the table in front of Liam and scrutinized him with his oversized binocular-like eyes. Your crossed arms and defiant expression betray you, Liam. You are angry and you have spoken in anger to your most dear and trusted friends. Tell me, did you mean all the things you said in your raised and heated voice? Tobodo asked pointedly, but quietly. Liam looked at Raja long and hard before letting his stiff shoulders relax with a deep breath. No. Then can you tell Raja what you do mean in a calm and controlled manner? Toboto encouraged. I know that this mission belongs to you. You are a great leader and I respect you for it. I just feel like second best sometimes, like I could do more, should be doing more. Raja moved to respond, but Toboto slapped his tongue over Raja's mouth. Let Liam finish, Toboto admonished. It's all right. I don't know what else to say for myself. My behavior was wrong and I am sorry, Liam apologized. Raja put his hand over Liam's. You are my trusted friend. You have invaluable skills that have saved our lives more than once. I could not have made this journey without you. The journey belongs to all of us, Raja professed. Liam pulled Raja into a giant bear-like hug, patting him firmly on the back. Raja groaned but smiled and returned his embrace. That's better, now. For you, young lady, Toboto jumped in front of Sydney and looked her over with the same discerning eyes. Sydney blushed. 
the tell-all blush and exquisite light in your eyes for one person in particular, but your furrowed brow and stern mouth reveal you are not sure of yourself. Are you aware of your great worth, Sydney, and how much you are loved? Toboto searched her eyes down into her soul. Yes, I think so. I just forget sometimes, Sydney struggled out. Then you must remind yourself often with kind thoughts and never let the cruel words of others determine how you feel about yourself, Toboto urged her. Sydney nodded her understanding. Raja looked as though he wanted to hug her, but didn't. And you, man of hope, Toboto jumped right onto Raja's shoulder and nestled near his ear. You have felt the most pain of all this day, inflicted by an evil enemy and powered by cruel lies. The Foy used the power of words to tear down and destroy. Your father was a strong man who loved you very much, but in the end, the Foy were too great in number. It was not your fault, Raja, and his death has given you the strength to save yourself, your friends, and all mankind. Toboto rubbed the tears off Raja's cheeks with his small, colorful fingertips. And you may, you have many who still live that love you. Don't be afraid. Embrace it. Toboto looked pointedly at Sydney before jumping down from Raja's shoulder. Raja's powerful glance tore into Sydney's heart. Raja, she was interrupted as Raja grabbed her and hugged her tightly and gave her a little kiss. Finally, Liam remarked to himself, Raja pulled back long enough to look in Sydney's eyes. I love you. I love you, Sydney choked out before re returning the hug. The most powerful words of all, Toboto grinned. That night, they all slept peacefully, feeling nothing but pure happiness. Sydney woke sniffing the air in confusion. She went over and nudged Raja awake. Good morning, Raja smiled. Do you smell that? Sydney asked worriedly. Raja sniffed the air with curiosity and then frowned. It's smoke. He shook Liam roughly. Wake up. Liam groaned and rolled over. Why? There's a fire. Raja spoke calmly, but what he said made Liam bolt upright and brush himself off like it was in flames. Sydney squinted into the distance and pointed. There. Raja followed her finger and saw the magnificent trees burning in the distance. Toboto fell out of the tree in front of them, hanging onto a branch by his tail. The Sapa's army has set the fire. They mean to draw you out. You must make for higher ground. Raja and Liam started packing up their satchels. Sydney gently kissed the chameleon on the head. Thank you, Toboto, for everything. Just between us, you are my favorite, Toboto whispered. Sydney smiled as Raja grabbed her hand and started running. They raced through the trees until coming upon a mountainside. Look, there's a trail. Liam spotted a pathway winding steeply toward the sky. Do you think it's safe? We won't last down long down here. I would say you found our best option, Raja grinned knowingly at Liam and patted his shoulder. Liam puffed up his chest in pride. The fire drew closer to the mountain as the day wore on. Smoke curled higher and higher until it surrounded the party, making it impossible to see. We have to keep moving, Raja pushed. How? Liam coughed on the smoke. A bleating made them turn their gaze farther up the path. It's a goat, a mountain goat. It looks so sweet. It must be our guide, Sydney exclaimed in relief. The goat was at their side in no time at all. Come with me. Sparoff will teach you how to walk on the mountain without falling, one step at a time. What if we miss a step and fall? Liam asked, still a little afraid. Then you just get back up again. Trust me, Sparoff smiled. As they followed Sparoff up the mountain, the smoke grew thicker, making all of them cough deep in their chest. Sydney was caught with an attack so strong she could not breathe and fell to her knees. Sydney, Raja put his arms around her, feeling helpless. Sparoff put his head by Sydney's chest and rubbed gently. Her breathing slowed and grew less labored. Persist, my child, one breath at a time, Sparoff encouraged her. 
Sydney nodded that she was ready to keep going. Raja helped her to her feet and supported her while she walked. They climbed above the smoke into the chilly mountain air. Sydney filled her lungs gratefully. I can breathe. Well, I can't feel my toes, Liam pointed out, stomping his feet. The trio pulled heavy cloaks out of their packs. Raja helped Sydney wrap up warmly. A little ways to go, my friends, Sparoff said as he continued to lead the way. They came upon a patch of ice, which Sparoff walked across with ease. Raja and Sydney held onto each other as they crept across the slippery surface. Liam tried to walk too quickly and lost his footing. His legs collapsed and split underneath him as his bottom hit the ground. As he rolled over, grimacing in pain, Sparoff trotted back to smile down at him. You must learn some flexibility, my friend. It was getting dark again by the time they reached Sparoff's cave. Liam collapsed in exhaust, uh, exhaustion and was soon snoring. Raja wrapped Sydney in a blanket and watched her dream. Unable to sleep himself, Raja sat in the entrance to Sparoff's home and looked over the burning valley below, so large that it lit up the sky like midday. All that they had witnessed in both fear and admiration was now engulfed in flames. The sight filled Raja with sorrow and despair. Sparoff appeared at Raja's side and laid down by him. Why do you look so sad? Raja shook his head, unsure. What if we don't make it down? Will it make it past the, will we make it past the fire tomorrow? Will Sydney and Liam make it through this? Try smiling, Sparoff suggested. What? Raja could not believe his ears. Smiling can help you get through anything, Sparoff showed Raja his own toothy grin. Raja chuckled and tried to imitate it, but only managed to look silly. That's the spirit. Now you have a big day ahead of you tomorrow. You should try and get some rest, Sparoff insisted. Raja rubbed his eye, his tired eyes, but shook his head no. Sparoff laid his head in Raja's lap. Be of good cheer, man of hope. All is not lost. The next morning, the fire was much closer. Sparoff woke the trio with a loud bleat. You must go now. The fire is spreading up the mountain. You don't have much time. They climbed down the other side, both swiftly and carefully. It was not long before all three were panting with exhaustion and thirst. Suddenly, Sydney stopped moving. Do you hear water? Raja and Liam paused to listen and heard a delicious sound. Raja picked up the pace in desperate need of a fresh drink. All three caught their breaths in awe when they reached the head of a magnificent waterfall feeding into an enormous river. Raja breathed a sigh of relief, got on his knees and cupped his hands full of the fresh sparkling liquid. Thinking it was a good idea to follow suit, Sydney and Liam kneeled down to drink as well. As Sydney put her hands in the water for the second time, she grazed, she grazed something slippery. Screaming, she jumped back from the bank. What, it, what, what is it? asked Raja and Liam simultaneously. They pulled out their knives and poised for an attack. Let's see. An adorable brown beaver popped his head out of the water. Be careful. You could really hurt a beaver by scratching its tail. Raja and Liam laughed at their own jumpiness. The beaver waddled out and shook the water off his fur all over the men, making them laugh even harder before extending his paw. I'm Gowie. Raja stopped laughing long enough to shake Gowie's tiny hand. It's a pleasure to meet you. I'm Raja and this is Liam. Liam shook Gowie's hand next. Hello. Sydney slowly made her way back towards the beaver. And what is your name, little girl who tried to rip off my tail? Gowie teased. I did no such thing, and I am not little, Sydney insisted. If you cannot take a joke, you will not get far in life. Now, let's get going. I do not move fast over land, so Sydney will have to carry me. Sydney shivered. Sorry, I could never carry a rodent. Raja and Liam snorted in humor. Gowie puffed up to his full height. I am a beaver. And you seem very nice, but you are heavy and slippery, Sydney shuddered again. 
Raja stepped forward. You must forgive Sydney. She recently had a bad experience with some leeches. Not that you're anything like a leech. I would be happy to carry you. Raja held out his arms, but Gowie stopped him with a raised hand. Sometimes in life, we must do what we do not wish to do before we can get on with what must be done. Sydney must learn this. Sydney took a deep breath and picked Gowie up. Just this once, she said. She tried to hold him at arm's length, but Gowie climbed up on her shoulder and snuggled under her chin. Raja and Liam continued to chuckle as they led the way. As they walked across soft green meadows, a building in the distance caught Liam's eye. It was a grand home, rich architecture surrounded by intricate landscape. Is that? It can be. It is. It's my home. Liam tried to run to his house. But Gowie stopped him by jumping out of Sydney's arms and biting Liam's ankle. Ouch! Wait, Sydney, what do you see? Gowie looked up into her eyes. Sydney's misty gaze was in the same direction as Liam's. Jez, my dog, she is, she was my best friend. That's impossible. Raja, you see my house, don't you? Liam insisted. Tears ran freely down Raja's eyes. I see my mother. But it's not her, is it? Raja asked. No, what you are looking at is one of my dams. I enchant them to appear as whatever the onlooker desires from their past. Why, Raja choked out, for protection to keep whoever trespasses here from going any further. You see, when we dwell on the past, whether good or ill, and do, do not allow ourselves to let go, it keeps us from ever moving forward, Gowie gently exclaimed, explained. Come, we have a ways to go yet. The trio turned regretfully away from the vision. Raja, last of all, he picked up Gowie and held him tight for comfort. Through some trees, they found a cliff overlooking the center of the gigantic waterfall they had drunk from. As Gowie pounced out of his arms, Raja screamed in horror. No, they could not believe their eyes. Gowie walked off the cliff and was walking in midair across the deep ravine. He looked back at them with raised eyebrows. Are you coming? Sydney and Liam backed up a step. Raza shook his head, open mouthed. Sometimes we must take a leap of faith, even if we do not see the way ahead. Now get over here before I come back and get you. Raja held onto Liam and set one foot out tentatively until it landed on something hard in midair. Roger looked up at Gowie with an amazed grin. A little faster, please. We don't have all day, Gowie grumbled. The trio held hands and walked carefully through the air, trying desperately not to look down at the sharp rocks hundreds of yards beneath them. When they reached the safety of solid ground again, Liam demanded answers. What was that? One of my bridges, they're invisible, Gowie explained like it was nothing unusual. For protection, Raja guessed. Naturally, enough useless chatter. Let's go, Gowie urged them on. It turned dark and Liam's stomach growled loud enough for everyone to hear. Isn't it time to rest and maybe eat something, Liam hoped? You must have patience, otherwise you will spend all your life whining and waiting instead of doing, Gowie pronounced. Liam rolled his eyes, growing tired of this beaver's life motto. The moon was high in the sky before Gowie finally stopped. Liam rubbed his eyes sleepily. Where are we? On the edge of a still clear lake sat a dozen beaver lodges. At least a hundred beavers of all colors and sizes rushed out to greet them. The trio laughed as they were hugged by furry arms and tickled by tiny whiskers. Astonishingly, Sydney seemed to be enjoying it most of all. Although we do not eat it ourselves, we took the trouble of preparing you some fish. No need to thank us, Gowie shouted over the din of happy beaver, baby beaver barks. We do thank you anyway, Sydney smiled, as they ate a delicious spread of trout. A few of the adult beavers formed an orchestra and played songs with instruments whittled by their own hands. The three humans clapped in rhythm to the music until Raja pulled Sydney to her feet and danced with them, with, him, with her. The night grew still as Raja, Sydney, and Liam curled up to sleep inside an oversized lodge surrounded by snoring baby beavers. Sydney awoke, 
coughing on smoke once more. Raja, get out, Raja coughed. Raja, Sydney, and Liam crawled out of the lodge and through a screen of smoke, they saw something none of them would ever forget. Osapa's soldiers were setting fire to the lodges, shooting the beavers with arrows as they ran out. With clenched jaws and fists, Raja and Liam both moved to fight. No, Gowie held them back. There are too many. We must flee before you are seen. Go. Liam and Sydney ran from the scene, but Raja stayed looking on, full of rage. Gowie bit him. We must go now. An arrow flew past Raja's head. He grabbed Gowie and ran after Sydney and Liam. Sydney's eyes filled with tears as she ran, blinding her vision. She tripped over a tree root and fell to her knees, her shoulders racked with sobbing. Raja found her on the ground and put his arms around her. Sydney? Gowie lifted up her head. My little Sydney, there will always be cause to mourn in life, but we cannot let we cannot let that stop us from completing our own mission. Come, we must keep moving. Gowie climbed on Sydney's shoulder and Raja pulled them up. The trio kept running. Once they were a day's distance away, Gowie made them a makeshift shelter for the night. Unable to sleep, the trio laid side by side, watching dark smoke curl through the sky above. Why, why so much death and suffering? Is this really the plan? How much must be sacrificed before we reach Kaura, Sydney burst out. Gowie stroked Sydney's cheek and shushed her. It is human to ask such questions, but some things only Inrock knows the answer to. We must simply trust and do what has been asked of us. Gowie tried to comfort her, but it's not simple, Sydney whispered. I know, little one, I know. Gowie held one of Sydney's hands until she fell asleep while Raja held the other. Raja's peace was broken by a nightmare that made him toss and turn, his brow sweating. The entire island was consumed by fire. Sydney and Liam were fighting with soldiers. In his nightmare, he was holding Enli in his hand and trying to throw the butterfly into the fire, but water fell from the sky and drowned out the flames. Enli flied safely away into the rainy sky. Raja woke with a start and saw the sun shining on Enli's wings. The butterfly alighted on Raja's pocket before flying away. Raja pulled the compass from his pocket and watched the needle swirl and settle, pointing to the largest dam he had ever seen at the base of their well-known waterfall. Raja, Raja gently poked Gowie awake with his finger. I'm up, I'm up. Gowie was embarrassed to have slept in. Raja pointed to the dam. Is that yours? Gowie puffed up his chest again in pride. My very finest. Gowie suddenly had a bad feeling. Why? Because we need to stop the fire in Losapa's army, Raja had hesitated. And I know how. Would you be willing to break that? Raja pointed at the dam again and Gowie's face fell. Sydney ran back into camp carrying a bunch of berries in her cloak. They are catching up to us. We've got to move. No more running. We are going to flood this island, Raja announced. What? Liam knocked over the fire he was building. And kill ourselves along with everybody else? Liam could not believe his ears. Raja put his hand on Liam's shoulder. Courage, my friend. Why don't we just get off the island before the fire reaches us and let the enemy burn, Liam argued. You must all agree before moving forward with a plan, Gowie counseled. Sydney moved to Raja and took his hand. Liam sighed. Gowie, how fast can you build a raft? Raja, Sydney, and Liam tied themselves fast to a rickety raft. I hope this thing holds together, Liam muttered. Don't you worry about that, Gowie snapped. The beaver put his hand on Raja's and looked him in the eye. I must ask you once more, is this the risk you want to take? Raja smiled ironically. Get on with it. Gowie laughed out loud with pride. I'm so proud of you, all of you, for your courage and love. He winked at Sydney. We will meet again, little one. Before Sydney could ask when, Gowie jumped into the water and swam to the bottom of his dam. Locking his powerful jaws on the supporting log, he chewed and tugged up above the fire. Up above, the fire started to lick up the trees surrounding the trio while they sat helplessly tied to the raft. Gowie, Raja shouted. The beaver's head popped out of the water and Gowie 
took a deep breath. Nearly there, he swam back down and continued breaking down the dam with his teeth. Raja could see soldiers behind the flames and smokes and they spotted the raft and aimed their arrows at the three riders. Yowie, Raja shouted again as thunderous, a thunderous crack echoed across the entire island. The dam across the waterfall collapsed and a wave of water a mile high gushed into the valley. The trio held on for dear life as the water hit the raft, pushing it up and back. Osapa's army was washed away and the flames fizzled out as the water level rose. The raft floated off the island and into the ocean beyond. Liam spat water out of his mouth. I'm soaked. Sydney still clung to the raft with white knuckles, her eyes closed tight. Raja put his hand over hers. It's all right. It's over now. A swirling, glowing portal opened up in the ocean in front of them. Raja and Liam looked at each other and then at Sydney. Her eyes turned from them back towards the island and saw Gowie floating in the water, waving them on. Are you ready? Raja asked tenderly. Sydney wiped her eyes. No, but are we ever? Raja and Liam and Sydney held on to each other and used their free hands to paddle the raft into the portal. <laughs>